So, Barbie. Barbie is this year 60 years old. At least that's 60 years old from her debut. We don't really know at what point Barbie came to life on the slab in the basement of her creator's house. But we're going to say she's 60 years old. You know, uh, usually these days, when you call somebody a Barbie, or usually a something Barbie, it's not an affirmation, right? It's more of a taunt. I mean, for example, uh, when conservative commenters uh, call or commentators called Wendy Davis uh, from Texas abortion Barbie, they were not being nice. And they were, I think when you do that, when you taunt somebody that way, you're saying the person is attractive in kind of a plastic way. I'm, I'm guessing, and has accessories. Um, so a little bit more about Barbie, though, because, yes, it's a taunt. There's a way in which maybe it's a little bit discredited. Uh, on the other hand, Barbie's doing great. Um, movie projects come and go. But at the moment, there is a plan because Mattel has created an in-house uh, movie department to spur on production of movies based on Mattel toys. And the first one is supposed to be a Barbie movie, a live-action Barbie movie starring Margot Robbie, she of I, Tanya, Tanya Harding fame. Maybe not the linkage Barbie wants to make exactly, but she was also in Tarzan, so there you go. Um, and so Mattel... Uh, we have great guests for you today, but not from Mattel. Mattel actually did not send a guest to us. And so for that reason, uh, we will dwell for just a moment on their financial problems, which, which have been acute over the years, especially in recent years. It's a troubled uh, toy company. Uh, they've been through four CEOs in five years. Uh, however, they're maybe turning a corner right now. And guess who's helping them turn the corner? Barbie. Barbie actually had a terrific 2018 nationally and internationally, got back over the one billion mark in gross international sales, uh, had a great fourth quarter uh, and helped Mattel show something of a profit as opposed to something of a loss. So even at 60 years old, Barbie has still got it and she can actually uh, help this company do what it needs to do, even as yeah, other, I mean, obviously, Barbie slumped a little bit as lo along with pretty much all physical toys when ele electronic games began to take over the attention of children more and more. But Barbie's having a little bit of a comeback right now, so that's worth noting. All right, joining us right now to get things started is Robin Gerber, attorney, senior fellow uh, in executive education at University of Maryland and national commentator on women, leadership, and politics. She's the author of several books, including Barbie and Ruth, The Story of the World's Most Famous Doll and the Woman Who Created Her, as well as the upcoming Barbie Forever Ever. <clears throat> Excuse me, her inspiration, history, and legacy. So, Robin Gerber, a welcome to our show. Thanks for having me. And why don't you introduce us a little bit to Ruth Handler? There is one person who birthed Barbie, and, and that is her name. Uh, who was she? Well, Ruth Handler was actually the child of Polish Jewish immigrants to America. She was born in 1916, and uh, she came to from Denver. She came with her husband to Los Angeles, and they started Mattel together. Um, and she really was the CEO and the person who ran the company, but she had one idea for a toy in the 1950s, and that was an adult doll, which really didn't exist for little girls to play with. Her idea was that little girls wanted to play at being big girls, and that was how she hit on the idea of having an adult doll. Right. And we say when we say adult doll, in other words, dolls were little babies. Uh, almost invariably, a doll was a little baby. So this, suddenly we have an idea of a doll who's uh, a grown-up girl, a uh, grown-up woman, uh, as to distinguish it from the other kind of adult dolls. However, we should mention the other kind of adult dolls because one of the templates, one of the inspirations for the way Barbie came out was a German toy, I believe, that was not intended for children. That's correct, yeah. Uh, you know, Ruth kept trying to get her research and design department to design an adult doll, and they were telling her during the 50s, well, Ruth, no mother will buy her daughter a doll with breasts, so just forget this idea. It's never going to work. And then she took her family, uh, the family went on a European vacation, and in a toy shop in Luzerne, Switzerland, she saw an adult doll dressed in beautiful clothing, uh, you would, if you looked at it, you would think it was a Barbie doll if you saw it today. And it was called Build Lily. It came from the Build newspaper cartoon about a character who was really sort of a um, gold-digging 
<laughs> young woman, uh, maybe even you'd call her a prostitute, but uh, it was a very salacious kind of cartoon. And the and the cartoonist thought that making it into a three dimensional doll would be fun for men to have as a gag sex toy. Uh, and so that's how this doll came to life. And then little girls saw it in Europe, thought it would be a fun toy to play with. Eventually, made it into toy stores, and that's where Ruth saw it was in a toy store. And she bought several and brought them back and said to her designers, "This is what I've been talking about. Mm. Make a doll like this." Now, from the so, get, from that the, was the prototype. Right from the get go, there were sort of two strategies. One of them was to sell sell people the doll. But the other re- strategy right away, I think, was to sell people outfits for the doll. Hence, Barbie was originally sold, I believe, in just a swimsuit, not to make her a sex object, but to create a market for some of this other stuff. Yes, exactly. And uh, Ruth and Elliot, her husband, had always had what they called the razor razor blade theory. That is that you make a toy that then you can, that w- operates as a base for ba- buying other things to go along with it. And, of course, Barbie was the ultimate uh, realization of that because not only clothes, and, and Ruth hired a wonderful designer out of a design school in Los Angeles to make those first clothes, but not only clothes, but also all of the little uh, accessories that go along with Barbie. And eventually, when she had a house, all the household items, so you had purses and uh, tiny little belts and picnic baskets and that kind of thing. And all, all of that, of course, was sold separately, still is sold separately. Right. And, and so anytime anything new comes along, there's a sales opportunity. Um, so, um, you know, there's sort of this weird middle European background to Barbie because we just des- described this uh, German toy that was meant for uh, adult men to have whatever fantasies they wanted to about. But there's uh, also an Austrian advertising genius. Tell us about Ernest Dichter. Yes. So Ernest Dichter uh, came from Austria, uh, obviously, um, you know, when Nazis came to power and he uh, escaped to America. He had studied with Freud. Uh, He was a psycho, what we would call, I guess, a psychoanalyst, psychotherapist, but he really was interested in working with corporations and and, uh, moving them to advertise their goods in an emotional, trying to get an emotional hook. So for instance... Uh, fashioning lipstick containers to be phallic looking Mm -hmm. or the idea of having a sexy model in a selling a convertible car. Uh, Those were the kind of Mad Men ideas, you know, like the show Mad Men. Uh, He was the original Mad Men. (laughs) And, uh, you know, he did very, very well. He was quite sought after all over the world for these ideas. He had the first focus groups And Ruth knew about him and hired him because she was worried that, in fact, mothers wouldn't buy a doll with press. And how is she going to market this doll to make it palatable for parents to buy it? Well, uh, let's hear uh, at least the audio portion of uh, part of that, uh, how to get parents to buy it. Barbie's small and so petite. Her clothes and figure look so neat. Her dancing outfit rings the bell. At parties she will cast a spell. Purses, and hats and gloves below. And all the gadgets gals adore. Barbie dress for swim and fun is only $3. Her lovely fashions range from $1 to $5. Someday I'm gonna be exactly like you. Till then I know just what I'll do. I'll make believe that I am so, Robin, you know, there's... Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, first of all, the trick was not to talk to the parents, but to talk to the kids. Yes, and that had been true uh, ever since Ruth changed the whole face of toy marketing back in 1955 when she agreed to uh, basically bet the whole net worth of Mattel on advertisements on a new children's show called the Mickey Mouse Club. And uh, they demanded that she pay up front in a year, for a year of advertising. And those ads were directed at kids. Now, up till then, the way you bought your toys for your kids was you looked in the Sears catalog and the parents decided what toys children would get. But once they started seeing these ads on TV that were aimed at them, kids then turned the tables and started, as they do today, <laughs> demanding that parents buy toys that they saw. 
So Ruth had turned that paradigm around in the mid-50s, and so by the time Barbie came along in 59, that was pretty well established by her. And yes, that ad, that first Barbie ad you just played, was aimed directly at kids. It only mentions the word doll one time. Mm -hmm. So it really creates uh, Barbie as a real person, and that was the idea that girls could see themselves as the doll, and that the doll was a teenage fashion model who would teach them good grooming. Which is also a little bit appealing to parents, right? I mean, because they're trying to get their kids to engage in good grooming. Yeah, that came directly out of uh, the Dichter focus ah, groups. Yes. Uh, so, but now the the other part of this psychology is aspirational. Um, similar, and even the music sounds a little bit like Disney. And so, you think about all those Disney princesses uh, of some of the golden age of animated Disney movies, which are kind of happening uh, coterminously. And and it's all about what you dream you can be. Um, the old dolls, the dolls that little girls have been playing with, were babies you had to take care of. Um, this was about something completely different. This was who I could grow up to be. Yes. I mean, baby dolls don't get, leave a lot of room for imagination in terms of what you're supposed to be. Right. You're supposed to be a mother to the baby doll. Right. <laughs> so, right. This, this, was, this broke the world wide open and is interesting and I think wonderful that the brand, the Barbie brand, has gone back to that idea. You can be anything uh, is one of the taglines and they really have harkened back to Ruth's original high concept idea, which was very simple. Little girls want to play being big girls. Right. And, and Barbie, one thing Barbie never did was have kids, right? I mean, she's always <laughs> been a career woman. That's correct. So, I mean, for all the grief that Barbie takes, uh, and we'll be getting into that grief in the in the second segment here, uh, about imposing all kinds of unrealistic um, ideas on girls and maybe making them feel bad about their bodies or, or just over-feminizing them or whatever, I mean— Barbie, she is really kind of way ahead of her time in the sense of, I'm not having kids, I'm having a career. Yeah, and she, and even in terms of the career, she was actually, uh, some of the careers that Barbie had, I'm not sure if I remember this correctly, but I think being a major league baseball player, or being an astronaut, there right. were several careers that she had before women actually did them. Right. Um, so we we got to add that uh, eventually the Barbie universe expanded. Uh, we got Midge and we got Ken. Uh, so tell us about Ken. So Ken, well, first of all, let's back up. One thing that we didn't say is that uh, Barbie has a real uh, full name, right? It's not just Barbie. No, Barbie Millicent Roberts is her <laughs> Is her actual name. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Ruth Handler, when she invented this toy, and remember, we're talking about a toy company inventing a new toy. Most new toys last about three years. Mm -hmm. She absolutely thought that's what would happen with this doll, that right. it would last about three years. So there wasn't a thought of this empire and, you know, all that came after it. But almost immediately, little girls started asking for a boyfriend. For right. Barbie. So hence and Ken, that's how Ken came along. Right. And we should say that Ruth's daughter was named Barbara and uh, her son, Kenneth, uh, gave the, uh, gave up the name Ken uh, to Ken. Well, he didn't give it up. He kept it, too. But um, <laughs> but he he was not entirely happy about all this, right? Uh, uh, I would say neither of the children uh, were particularly happy. The Ken doll, of course, had no anatomical, uh, you know, you couldn't see any even bulge. Right on the Ken doll, and that you know, I think because Ken was an adolescent at the time, that was led to some teasing. And, and Barbara, you know, to this day, I believe, won't be called Barbie. She wants to be called Barbara, and you know, was not happy with the association. But Ken didn't, again, she didn't... was a teenager, and here's this voluptuous doll right. <laughs> with her name. So, uh, you know, kids are going to react. But then, what can we do, right, as parents? Right. So, I mean, so Ken had a couple of problems with Ken. One of them was, as you as you said, he actually in a letter he said that the dolls were kowtowing to those who can't accept the issue of their own sexuality. I guess that's the lack of genitalia or whatever. But mm -hmm. um, right. but he also didn't like the materialism. Right. There's like again, Barbie and Ken are acquisitional characters. Yeah. Well, he was. Yes, he was an interesting guy, Ken, and uh, he. Um, turned out to be gay himself, mm -hmm. ironically, you know, um, since the doll, the Ken doll became a gay icon, you know, as 
as time went on and he started to have the doll started to have fashions that seemed to to look to some people like they were what you know a, a gay man might wear right so he then you know picked up this this reputation the doll did um so yeah ken was um he was a, an original thinker i would say so yes he had problems on a political level as well as on a personal level with the doll right uh, probably a turning point for ken the doll was 1993 earring magic ken right Yes, that was one of the ones that, uh, you know, obviously the doll was not in any way marketed to be gay. But, yes, that was picked up by the gay community at a time when, uh, well, of course, you know, AIDS was first Mm -hmm. being discovered and uh, dealt with, and the gay community was very active and politicized. Um, We should say uh, just a little bit more before we say goodbye. We'll never say entirely goodbye to Ruth, but but Ruth Handler herself developed breast cancer and then did a remarkable thing, right? She actually invented a prosthesis? Yes, yes. She discovered uh, when she got breast cancer in 1970, uh, she discovered, and she had a mastectomy, First of all, in the 70s, women did not tell people they had a mastectomy. It was something, unfortunately, the women felt they had to be ashamed of. Mm -hmm. And when she went in to be fitted uh, to get a prosthetic, they sort of tossed it over the dressing room door, and she felt humiliated. And she said, well, I can... She looked at these statistics and saw that millions of women were going to be getting breast cancer, and... Uh, she thought there's a better way, and she actually used the material they were using for baby dolls at Mattel, um, and help had some of her designers help her, and created this company called Nearly Me with, as she put it, you know, prosthetics that had a right and a left in different sizes, just like real women, um, and she marketed it. She had a team of women like herself who had mastectomies and created salons for women to be fitted so they could feel comfortable and respected. So, yes, she built another successful, wonderful company that helped a lot of women. Um, uh, uh, In a slight departure from this pretty amazing narrative of success that began way back in 1959 with the introduction of Barbie and and she founds her own toy company, uh, but she does get into trouble in the 1970s, kind of around the same time that she's starting to battle uh, cancer. She's ultimately ousted from Mattel uh, after some uh, pretty serious allegations. Yeah, there were financial improprieties, uh, something called a scheme called bill and hold, where you report higher uh, orders than you actually have. Mm-hmm. It was a time when Mattel was selling, uh, was buying other companies with Mattel stock, so they couldn't afford to have the stock price go down. And so cooking the books was, you know, what was done to keep it appearing that Mattel was doing better than it was. And she was uh, pushed out of the company in '74. Uh, along with Elliot, although he was not part of the scheme, mm-hmm. she pleaded uh, nolo contendere, which is basically a, a guilty plea, uh, no contest plea, to the charges in 78 mm-hmm. and uh, was given a community service sentence. Mm-hmm. So it was a very, very terrible time in her life, a very low point. Mm-hmm. Um, the scheme, while it was absolutely wrong, mm-hmm. was not an uncommon scheme in corporate America. Mm-hmm. So... Um, you know, she felt uh, really wronged by the whole thing. and But she turned around and started this new company and, you know, uh, really f- discovered a way to help other people and still be a, a corporate leader. Right. And we never got a white-collar crime Barbie. So, um, no. although, <laughs> though maybe there'll be a Theranos Barbie eventually, you know, Elizabeth Holmes Barbie. Uh, I'm, I guarantee you the Barbie uh, epithet got slapped on Elizabeth Holmes at some point or other because that's just the way the world works. It's a cruel <laughs> world. But anyway, nobody's perfect. The point is, you know, if all she ever did in her life was invent Barbie, that would be pretty awesome to have invented Barbie, founded that company, and then uh, as, as sort of a second or third chapter invented this uh, new kind of breast prosthetic that's a that's a pretty good run yes she she was an extraordinary corporate leader probably one of the greatest of the last century 
Uh, all right. So we're going to take a, a break. We're going to say goodbye to Ruth a little bit, but keep saying hello to Barbie uh, and get into some of the, you know, perhaps more complicated uh, effects that Barbie may or may not have on young girls after this. Now we're on to our second phase of discussing Barbie. Robin Gerber is still with us. As you recall, uh, she's the author of several books, including Barbie and Ruth, the story of the world's most famous doll and the woman who created her, as well as the upcoming Barbie Forever, her inspiration, history, and legacy. Joining us now is Eileen Zerbriggen, uh, professor of psychology at UCSC, focusing on feminist studies and pop culture. She's the co-author of a 2014 University of Oregon study called Boys Can Be Anything, Effect of Barbie Play on Girls career cognitions. And in just a second, we'll also be talking to Stacy McBride Irby, a former Barbie designer and pro- project manager for Mattel and creator of the So In Style line of African-American Barbie. She's since introduced her own line called, uh, called Pretty Girls Dolls and founded IMU, a company devoted to creating increasingly diverse uh, dolls. But uh, Eileen Zerbriggen, uh, we're going to begin with you because uh, you, in fact, uh, have studied the uh, the impact, the psychological impact of playing with Barbies versus playing with a, a different kind of toy. Um, tell us about the study that you did on this. Sure. Uh, this was um, in uh, collaboration with my colleague Aurora, Aurora Sherman at the University of Oregon. And we looked at uh, girls ages four to seven, and we brought them into the laboratory and let them play with either um, a Barbie doll. Uh, One was a fashion Barbie with um, a short skirt and some sparkly clothes, and the other was a a doctor Barbie, and she had a stethoscope and some of the accessories of doctors. Um, And then a third group of girls played with a Mrs. Potato Head doll, who's uh, female, you know, um, represented as female and had some fashion accessories also, but is not a human-shaped uh, doll. And then we asked girls, we showed them pictures of different career settings and asked them um, which of those jobs that they could do when they grow up and how many of them a boy could do when he grows up. And we found that the girls who played with the Barbie dolls saw few, uh, fewer careers as possibilities for themselves when they were adults than they saw um, for boys, but also than the girls who played with the Mrs. Potato Head saw. So this uh, short period of playing with a Barbie doll um, seemed to impact the number of careers that girls were at that moment thinking were possibilities for themselves. You know, it's sort of uh, surprised, uh, uh, surprising to me. I mean, I'm not here to be any kind of advocate for Barbie, but uh, Barbie... Uh, and, and obviously the, the study had its controls on it and its parameters on it. But Barbie does have jobs and stuff like that. Mrs. Potato Head, like all she does is keep Mr. Potato Head together, basically, right? And keep him from drinking too much or whatever his problems are. I mean, it's weird that Mrs. Potato Head would uh, lead girls to see more possibilities for themselves than, say, Dr. Barbie. Right. Well, there's different kinds of controls that we could have used. Um, And some other studies that have looked at Barbie, like in coloring books, have used different kinds of controls, like a more um, normal sized and shaped doll. Um, And they they found uh, effects that had to do with uh, body dissatisfaction and um, wanting to be thinner um, compared to that other control. But but anyway, but to your question, um, why didn't we see a difference between the doctor Barbie and the fashion Barbie? Because they do have um, different accessories with them, and potentially you would think that playing with a doctor doll should be stimulating this idea that, yes, I can be a doctor too. Um, our, our thought is that the, um, the size and shape of Barbie and the fact that she um, is so associated through the years with fashion and appearance and being a model um, or you know, some sort of appearance-oriented career that um, a few minutes of putting in those doctor accessories wasn't enough to overcome um, basically the associations that Barbie has because of her unrealistic body shape and also because of the uh, more common um, 
presentation of, of Barbie as a fashion model or princess or some other very, very feminine uh, typed um, role. Now, obviously, life doesn't take place in, in a vac- vacuum. So, I mean, there are a lot of things that ultimately play into the kind of conclusion that a little girl might draw from this very brief play experience. And it's not restricted to just that play experience and the, the dolls in front of her. Because, I mean, otherwise, young boys might be intimidated by by G.I. Joe uh, or He-Man or, I mean, all the comic books I read growing up, the guys were were big and hulky and ripped in, in a way that I wasn't and probably wasn't ever going to be. I, I assume that boys, because they have other ways of having empowerment communicated to them, are a little bit less easy to, to cow this way? Well, uh, yeah, it's really interesting and important to think about boys, too. And there is some evidence that um, boys are impacted by the increasing muscularity of action figures and other representations of men and masculinity that are provided to them. So their body image potentially is being impacted by this as well. But one of the differences between the toys and um, roles that are put forward for girls as opposed to boys is that the feminine ones are often more passive. Um, They're more about being something to be looked at, whereas the, so for example, the He-Men or the other kinds of G.I. Joe action figures that you're um, referring to, Colin, uh, they uh, they might convey unrealistic impressions about body size and shape um, that's a t- that is or is not achievable for boys, but they're also enacting power in the world. So the the focus is on what these dolls are doing rather than how they look. So Robin Gerber, uh, you're listening to all this. I'm interested in your reaction. We know that you know in the uh, in in the past few decades, Barbie has had all kinds of jobs, like 200 different uniforms, outfits, and, and roles uh, over these uh, these last 60 years. Um, it's interesting that a, a little girl would be um, would draw the conclusion that they seem to draw in that study. What's what's your take on that, Robin? Uh, well, <laughs> there'd be a lot to discuss about that. I think, first of all, any of these studies have to be highly contextualized because there is so there are so many other uh, you know inputs on a four to seven year old. I'm not sure how much four to seven year olds. I have a five year old grandson are really thinking about careers altogether, or really even understand the concept of career. And you know, I assume the study uh, asked what careers they were thinking about before and after. Um, but again, I'm just not sure that that's even something particularly that a four to seven year old understands very well. But overall, I think uh, that there's this documentary that came out recently, Tiny Shoulders, with the idea that, uh, you know, how much of the burden of sexism uh, are we going to put on this little plastic toy? And I think, as you said, there are, uh, you know, influences on boys as well. And we don't look at those in the same way. The fact is that the the sexism in society, which is still very prevalent, and in fact maybe more prevalent, uh, just can't all be laid at Barbie's feet. Ruth, let me tell you, Ruth's reaction to this was, um, you know, this is very much an issue for parents. Mm. And that's what I always believed. Oh, this- I, raised a, I raised a daughter, and I gave her Barbie dolls, and... She's a highly empowered 37-year-old with her own company. Although, Stacy, we do also know that, um, oh, excuse me, Eileen, we'll get to Stacy in a second. Eileen, we do know that, you know, if we could put some kind of growth ray onto Barbie and, and raise her up to uh, a normal human size, she'd have, what, something like a 38 bust and an 18 waist and 36 hips. I mean, I, I could probably uh, work out at the gym and take steroids or something and maybe get up close to G.I. Joe, but there are ways in which Barbie is almost impossible to be. Well, yeah, I mean, some... some um authors have said that she wouldn't actually be able to hold up her head. Um, and yeah, she's, her, her, her physique is, is impossible. But, but I just, um, uh, just to respond a little bit, I totally agree that um, you know, any one doll or toy or, or video is, is not you know, a, a demon that we would want to focus all our attention on. The point really is that we live in a culture that still is very sexist and that limits girls' um, uh, Opportunities or activities that they that are uh, communicated to them as being appropriate, 
Um, we live in a culture that really sexualizes women, and so Barbie is a part of that. And if Barbie was the only um, unrealistically shaped um, image that girls saw, it wouldn't really be such a big deal. Um, but we're bombarded with these um, with these different unrealistic images of body shape, and also girls do girls do get the message that there are certain careers that are open to them and certain careers that aren't. And so this is just this is a study about one particular aspect about culture. It's an interesting aspect because Barbie is a very iconic doll, and most girls have played with Barbie. Um, many girls have many many Barbies, and so it, again, it's not to demonize Barbie, but to say um, that she is a represent she she does represent some of the broader cultural message that is being put forward. And then also, I think because she's so iconic and and she's. Um, She's in almost every girl's uh, toy chest. When Mattel uh, decides to present more diverse appearing dolls and to focus on different careers, that can potentially have a positive impact on girls. All right. Now, speaking of diverse, uh, it's time to tackle uh, another part of that equation with Stacey McBride Irby, as I said before, a former Barbie designer, project manager at Mattel, and now the creator of, uh, well, uh, no, then the creator of So in Style, uh, a line of African-American Barbies. She has since then introduced her own line called Pretty Girls uh, Dolls. It's P-R-E-T-T-I-E, uh, and founded IMU, a company devoted to creating increasingly diverse dolls. Welcome to our conversation, Stacey. Hey, Colin Hart. Hello, how are you? Good. So, uh, Stacy's joining us by Skype. Uh, and um, so, uh, first of all, um, Barbie, obviously, in 1959, was exclusively uh, a, a young white woman. How soon did Mattel start to introduce other races for Barbie? Well, in 1980, they introduced the first black Barbie. But um, in the 70s, late 70s, when I was playing with Barbie, um, Really, I had one option. I had the white Barbie, and I actually loved playing with her. She was like my fantasy world. She had the dream car, the dream house, the all the fashions, and Barbie actually inspired me to want to be a fashion designer. Um, <laughs> so so uh, once you got in there, did you start trying to push Mattel for maybe a more expansive version of what uh, a Barbie of color could be? Yes. Yeah, so that's um, when I did get into Mattel, I did notice there was a lack of um, diverse dolls or mm -hmm focus on them. So, um, and I also realized that my daughter wasn't playing with Barbie. Like I felt, you know, in, in the past that I played with her. So, um, I noticed that and I did pitch a concept to, um, the higher ups at Mattel for me to create a line of African-American dolls. And they, you know, they understood my story with my daughter, with myself and, allowed me to create a, a fashion line of dolls um, where the faces had more features of an African-American. And um, I chose a different body type um, that focused more on reality. And, and how easy uh, a sell to Mattel executives was that? I mean, Barbie, uh, b basically, as I understand it, their approach to making Barbie a different race was simply to say, take exactly the same doll and, and tint it a different color. You're, now you're talking about changing the shape of the doll. Well, how okay uh, with that was Mattel? Oh, they were fine. They actually already had the sculpt from a um, collector line of dolls that they were using. Hmm. So this head um, basically had full a fuller nose, fuller lips, and um, some of the hair textures that I chose were more authentic to the African American. Um, and I gather that Ken uh, has uh, some new possibilities too, right? Can't you can't you now get Ken in slim, broad, or original as a, in addition to Ken in different races? Oh, I'm not sure about since I'm not there anymore. I'm not sure yeah. what was going on. Robin, do you know about that? Have they? Have they? How many new options for Ken are there? Um, well, we know there's now four Barbie types. Yeah. Uh, I I'm sorry, I can't. I don't 
Nobody studies no, Ken. If Ken has been changed, <laughs> nobody yet. studies Ken. There's still, there's an opening somewhere for a professor of Ken studies somewhere. Uh, yeah. Ken, <laughs> Ken's underexplored in this regard. Anyway, well, I, I, somehow or other, Josh Lea came up with this in the notes. It says that you can get Ken in slim, broad, or original uh, shapes. So I guess uh, uh, Colin, I yeah. do see that on the web page right now. I'm I'm on Mattel's web page, and they do have a broad Ken and an original at least. Yeah. So um, I, I want to get here both Stacy and Eileen I about this, but um, but uh, so Stacy, you're saying that when you went to Mattel with this idea, they already kind of had some clue that Barbie's shape was going to have to change or at least uh, be available in more options. Um, not so. I came to them with the concept of changing the African American, not necessarily focusing on the shapes, but again, um, my daughter wasn't playing with the doll. And I felt like the times were changing and we needed to go more focused on what society looks like, not just what, you know, we saw back in the 70s or 80s. So um, they did listen to me at the time. Barack Obama was a candidate for presidency and Disney was about to come out with their first African-American princess. So that's when I felt like they needed to jump on board with what was going on and to keep up. So uh, finally, in 2016, there was a curvy Barbie uh, introduced, uh, and uh, you know she's she's a little bit. I don't know how to describe curvy Bar- Barbie. Somebody, I'll just get in trouble uh, if I try. But Eileen, do you know whether uh, Mattel was influenced by the kind of research that you and others were doing in terms of coming up with curvy Barbie, who isn't this impossibly wasp waist wasted uh, Barbie that we knew from the past? Yeah, I, I'm not sure if they were influenced by the research, but um, I know that there were other manufacturers who were introducing dolls that were um, m- more less unrealistic in their body shape. So uh, if nothing else, maybe that market pressure might have helped to move them. And I would just say, too, that the study that, that I was part of about the career aspirations, that's really the only one that I know of that looked at career aspirations and Barbie, but there's several that have looked at body image and those results are consistent that um, it's potentially um, a more positive experience for girls to play with realistically sized uh, fashion dolls than um, the very unrealistic body shape of Barbie. All right. So uh, I feel like I have to do something about the unrealistic body shape of Ken. But that'll be my personal request now. All right. We're going to take a break right now. Uh, we're going to say goodbye and thank you to Robin uh, Gerber. Uh, her book, uh, her books are Barbie and Ruth, the story of the world's most famous doll and the woman who created her, as well as the upcoming Barbie Forever, her inspiration, history and legacy. Ellen Zerbrigan, uh, professor of psychology at UCSC, focusing on feminist studies, uh, co-author of the 2014 University of Oregon study, Boys Can Be Anything. Effect of Barbie play on girls' career cognitions. And Stacy McBride Irby, um, former project manager at Mattel, creator of the So In Style line of African American Barbies, and has since uh, developed her own line called Pretty Girl, uh, Pretty Girls Dolls, and founded the IMU Company. All right, we're going to take a little break here. When we come back, uh, we'll be talking about just one more facet, one of the m- one of the many ways that Barbie comes into our houses and our lives. Like Barbie are the models in the Frederick's catalog From rags to wishes in my dreams I could have it all Hey kids, I'm Public Radio Barbie. I've got my headphones and my microphone and I've I got my my headphones and my microphone. It seems like I should have more stuff. I mean, should pizza maker Barbie have more stuff than I do? Because she does. Today's show was produced by Ken Nalea and me, Kion Wolf. The part of Bill Curry was played by Midge. On tomorrow's show, we're in New Haven to talk about the power of prosecutors. And now, back to Colin. So when you have kids, you know, it's one thing to have a whole set of ideas that you've made up in your mind about how your kids are going to grow up. And I think many of us start out with the finest of intentions. Uh, I'm, I'm recalling some people I knew who had decided that they would not give their little boy guns, toy guns to play with, no toy guns, and then watched in horror one day when at the age of three or four he was sitting at the dinner table and taking a piece of Wonder Bread and carefully biting it, he gnawed it into the shape of a gun. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's almost like they're imprisoned trying to break out or something. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. So you start out with all kinds of ideas and then, you know, there's like stuff that your kids want and uh, it's more difficult to explain why they can't have them based on your principles. And I think a lot of people go into the whole Barbie thing with a certain set of mixed feelings. And so we're going to talk to someone who I think fits maybe that description. I'm Mahal Levram, senior writer for Fortune, uh, uh, focusing on business, finance, and technology. You can find uh, the, in, on their site her piece titled My Relationship with Barbie. It's complicated. Uh, so uh, welcome to our show, Mihal. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So did I describe you accurately? Are you somebody who maybe, <laughs> you know, maybe thought, well, there's a better way. There's a better world. I'm not going to give my daughter this toy that's going to create all kinds of unrealistic expectations. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I do have a complicated relationship with Barbie, kind of a love-hate thing going on. And um, I didn't really think about Barbies for a very long time until I had two girls. And um, at some point, this was a couple of years back, they started asking for Barbies. And I said, no, but I couldn't really explain why. Um, or I couldn't come up with a good enough explanation for a you know six and seven year old. Um, and around the same time or shortly after, I happened to embark on a uh, story for Fortune magazine on Mattel, the maker of Barbie. Um, and so it was really a, a great opportunity to kind of explore why I had certain feelings about this doll and also interview a bunch of friends of mine who were kind of in the same boat. Right. So, I mean, just to backtrack, though, for a second, I think it's one thing to try to outlaw a toy that you never had and know nothing about. It's another thing to tell your children that they can't have a toy that you had and loved and you had more than one Barbie, right? I did. So when I was growing up, I didn't I didn't actually have any Barbies until my family moved to the United States. And when I was nine years old, um, I basically inherited these hand-me-down Barbies. And I trust me, I remember the, the dresses I got. I remember, you know, and there were all the blonde Barbies, the kind of traditional old style Barbie. But I remember the case that they came in. I remember all of it. And I it was like a treasure box. And it was it was amazing. I mean, it was like the best present I'd, I'd gotten at that point. And I loved playing with them. Um, but I also, you know, in hindsight, I, I feel like I, I have a lot of questions. I mean, I had a lot of, um, uh, I guess, issues and, and sort of you know, confidence issues about my own appearance. I do not look like a Barbie. They at the time did not have a frizzy haired Barbie. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I didn't have a, a Barbie that looked like me. I think a lot of girls didn't. Um, and even if you're blonde-haired, you don't look like a Barbie. It's anatomically impossible, right? Um, so I do think, you know, while I don't blame Barbie for um, any uh, uh, confidence issues or the extent of confidence issues as a girl growing up, um, I don't know that the impact was, uh, you know, net positive. Right. And I mean, there were certain things that you held against Barbie. For example, there was, a, I think, a teen Barbie whose theme included the notion that math class is tough. Yeah. And it's funny because I grew up in a family where um, my mom was a, a computer programmer. Um, I did not like math, but my, my mother was, that's her passion is, is math and engineering. And um, same with my dad. And um, it didn't jive, you know, it's like I, I, I just, those kind of, that kind of um, aura, that kind of, you know, it, reputation that Barbie had. And despite all of Mattel's efforts, even back then, to have all, you know, Barbie with all these different careers, you know, why is she always wearing heels? Why is math hard for her? It just, it didn't totally jive with my, uh, you know, the impressions that I had, the conflicting impressions I had of women in my life. So I mean, we should say that Barbie has addressed these kinds of things. If you think Barbie uh, isn't ever thinking about STEM, uh, you uh, underrate Barbie's malleability and opera and ability to at least attempt to change with the times. Let's talk about the dream gap. What's that? It's the gap that comes between girls and their full potential. You see, starting at age five, girls stop believing they can be presidents, scientists, astronauts, CEOs, and the list goes on. Why? 
Because what else are we going to believe? When by age seven, we're more likely to think that boys are smarter than us. When we are three times less likely to be given a science-related toy. We need to see brilliant women being brilliant to imagine ourselves doing what they do. So suddenly there were Barbies uh, with uh, STEM themes uh, in their accessories. And, and Mahal, there's obviously also, as we said in the previous segment now, Barbies with different body types. Uh, there's Barbies with different kinds of hair. Uh, there's even some Kens, as we said, with different... Apparently, according to you, there's a dad bod Ken, which probably is going to turn out to be a toy which... If I, you know, really worked out a lot, I could get maybe a dad bod Ken, but uh, or a Ken. <laughs> I think he's a very popular uh, no. uh, toy, to be so, honest. <laughs> so, I mean, they've made these efforts. I mean, they, mm-hmm. they in fact, don't want to wear the kind of uh, labels uh, that they've been given in the past. And how much of a difference does that make to either to you or to some of the other women that you spoke to? You know, it, it makes a difference. And obviously having different ethnicities in particular, I think, is super important because, you know, you, you, you want be what you can see, right? And and it's really important to have little girls and boys be able to play with toys that, that look like them. You know, that said, okay, close your eyes and think of a Barbie. What image do you have in your mind? You know, I think most people, it's a, it's a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Barbie with, you know, a really slender body and big boobs, right? And there's nothing wrong with that, but that is still the picture that most of us have in our mind. And I can tell you that for myself and for my friends who grew up around the same time, you know, maybe there were different career Barbies out there, astronaut Barbie or whatever, but when we were playing with them, we put dresses on, big frilly dresses on them and pretended like they were going to parties and they wore heels. And so, you know, again, it's not that that's all bad, but I feel very conflicted about pushing or even enabling my own daughters to have that image today. But so what do you do about it? I mean, uh, and I know that you've, you and your daughters are also been watching some Barbie cartoons. I mean, how, uh, in, somebody said earlier, I guess it was the, the founder of, of Barbie, the creator of Barbie said, this is all about conversations that you have with your kids as opposed to how Barbie looks or what Barbie does. Absolutely. I mean, I think that toys, whether and and content, you know, whether it's technology or not, I think that um, if it sparks a conversation, great. So my approach to both the Barbie conversation and, you know, increasingly as my daughters are getting older, technology is to, to do it with them, to experience it with them and use it as a learning opportunity to talk about, you know, why I don't necessarily think something is the best, um, you know, lesson for them and the best example for them to have. And, you know, I think my knee-jerk reaction initially, to like, no, you can't have a Barbie doll, um, that doesn't work. That never works. That's like, that's a great way of getting your kid to really want to play with something. Although, although that's true, actually, the more forbidden you make anything, it's like the kid biting the gun out of the piece of bread. They're totally. they're, they're probably going to do that. <laughs> although, you know, you do have friends who are, you know, so to speak, hardcore feminists. Were there ones who took the position, nope, nope, that body is coming into my house over my dead body? You know, no. And actually, I was surprised that my, like, one of my friends who I consider the most hardcore feminist was like really ambivalent about it. And I think part of the reason is because today, um, you know, our kids for better or worse are growing up with so many different um, influences and exposure um, to, to, to different elements. And um, so, you know, again, there are, there are good and bad um, aspects to that flow and, you know, just, massive influx of of information. But I think that there's no one thing that's going to have, um, you know, the most influence on on them today. There are just so many toys and, um, you know, things to do out there um, for for kids. But um, but yeah, I was surprised. I was actually surprised. You know, one thing I'll say is that I I do think that because Mattel has really tried to to change um, in the last 10 years or so, I would Mm -hmm. say, um, I think it could be like 
my generation, while some of us are still ambivalent about Barbies, there is a negative association there. You know, there's kind of this like, oh, I really enjoyed playing with them, but like, I don't want to enjoy playing with them. And it, and and there is this love hate thing for a lot of people. Um, I think it could take a generation for um, Mattel to to you know a generational change for Mattel to really like lose that kind of stigma. Right. There's um, a bit, there's a better day coming for Barbie. Uh, Mahal Lover, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we're actually right out of town here. Time here. Senior writer for Fortune, she wrote my relationship with Barbie. It's complicated. Hey, quit watching those Katy Perry videos on your screen. Play with your Barbie for a while.